Since Einstein loved using trains in his thought experiments, let's imagine one too. Picture this. Alice is standing on a train platform. A train is moving at a constant speed of V past her from left to right. Inside the train sits Bob. Now, let's talk about how Alice and Bob might describe the same event. For example, Bob dropping a ball inside the moving train. Alice sees the event from the platform, and Bob sees it from inside the train. Since they are in different frames, they will record different values for the same event. Let's say Alice uses a ruler to measure position and a clock to measure time. She calls the position of the event X and the time T. Bob does the same in the train and calls his measured position X prime and his time T prime. So now the question is, how do we convert between what Alice measures and what Bob measures? Now see, before Einstein, Scientists believed time was the same for everyone, everywhere. This idea led to what we call the Galilean transformation. According to this, time is universal, and therefore t prime equals t. But the position is a little different. Since Bob is moving forward with speed v, so after time t, the origin of the coordinate axis of Alice will be somewhere here but the origin of the coordinate axis of Bob will be at a distance v times t from this point, right? So, if we assume the ball is at this point somewhere inside the train, then this will be the position of the ball according to Alice, which will be x, and this will be position of the ball according to Bob, which will be x prime. So we can clearly see that x equals v times t plus x prime, and therefore x prime equals x minus v times t. So the Galilean way of switching between frames is this. x prime will be this, and t prime is the same as t. This works well for everyday things like cars, balls, trains, bullets, as long as the speeds are much lower than the speed of light. Now, here comes the real surprise. Scientists started studying how light behaves. They expected that if Bob shines a light inside the train, Alice would see the light moving at the speed of light, plus the speed of the train. But experiments showed something shocking. Alice and Bob both see the light moving at the exact same speed. No matter how fast Bob moves, the speed of light never changes. This broke the Galilean idea completely. If time is truly the same for everyone, and distances change only by v times t, then how can the speed of light stay the same for both Alice and Bob? Einstein solved this puzzle by realizing that space and time are not separate and fixed, but they are deeply connected, and they must adjust depending on how fast someone is moving. That's when the Lorentz transformation came into the picture. Unlike Galilean transforms, Lorentz transforms change both position and time. So it's like both x prime and t prime are now dependent on both x and t, which means x prime equals a times x plus b times t, and t prime equals p times x plus q times t, where a, b, p, and q are some constant values. In simple words, space and time are no longer separate. They're mixed together. Now we find the values of these constants using two basic postulates that Einstein proposed. First, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames, and second, the speed of light is constant for all observers. After doing some math, okay, a lot of math, we arrive at these two equations. x prime is equal to gamma times x minus v times t. Then t prime is equal to gamma times t minus v divided by c squared times x. This c is the speed of light, and gamma, also called the Lorentz factor, is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So if you truly understand these two equations, then you've understood the heart of special relativity. Now, what can we do with these two equations? Let us see. Consider this scenario. Bob is standing inside a train holding a long pole. 
From Bob's point of view, he is at rest with respect to the train, and so he says, My pole is just one meter long, nothing special. But now, the whole train, with Bob inside, is moving to the right at 0.8c relative to Alice, who is standing on the platform. Now Alice sees Bob moving past her, and she wants to measure the length of the same pole. But here's the big twist. She will say that Bob's pole is not one meter long. It is something else. But why is that? This is because of the Lorentz transformation. Say, the left end of the pole is at x, 1 prime, and the right end of the pole is at x, 2 prime. Since Bob is holding the pole at rest with respect to the pole, the event for both ends is measured at the same time. So Bob says my pole is x, 2 prime minus x, 1 prime, or 1 meter, right? Now, before we proceed further, note that to measure the length of a moving object in your own frame, like Alice measuring Bob's moving pole, you have to look at both ends of the object at the exact same time in your frame. That's because if you check one end a little later than the other, the object might have moved in that tiny gap of time, and you'll get the wrong result. So length must always be measured by noting the positions of both ends simultaneously in your frame. Bob is holding the pole at rest in his own frame. So for him, it's simple. He just measures the distance between the front and back ends without worrying about timing, because in his view, the pole isn't moving at all. Keep this in mind. Now, if we assume that the left end of the pole is at x1 for Alice, and time at which it is measured is t1, and the right end of the pole is at x2 with time t2, so using this equation, we get x1 prime as this in terms of x1 and t1. So x1 prime over gamma equals x1 minus v times t1. Similarly, we get x2 prime over gamma equals x2 minus v times t2. Subtract both of these equations to get this. Now, this will become x2 prime minus x1 prime over gamma equals x2 minus x1 minus v times t2 minus t1. Now this is 1 meter, and thus it will be 1 over gamma equals this will be the same as the length of the pole measured by Alice, and thus it will be, say, L. Now here's the main thing. This will be minus times delta t, which denotes the difference in time of measurement between the two ends of the pole in Alice's frame. Remember, Alice is trying to measure the length of a moving object, and that requires her to look at both ends simultaneously in her own frame. This means that delta t equals zero for Alice. So we are left with L equals one over gamma. Here, V is 0.8c, and thus gamma equals this, or five over three. This means L equals three over five, or 0.6 meters. Wow, this is what is called length contraction, and it's one of the most striking effects of special relativity. Even though the pole is one meter long in its own rest frame or the Bob's frame, it appears only 0.6 meters long to Alice because it's moving at a high speed relative to her. This isn't an illusion or a measurement error. It's a real physical prediction of how space and time behave at high speeds. The faster something moves relative to you, the shorter it gets along the direction of motion. At everyday speeds, this effect is too tiny to notice. Now, here's a question for you. If the same one meter pole is instead held by Alice and is at rest in her frame, and Bob moves past her at the same high speed, what length will Bob measure for that pole in his moving frame? Will it still be one meter or something else? It will be less than one meter because from Bob's moving frame, the pole is now in motion and therefore appears contracted, and the length turns out to be the same as one divided by gamma or 0.6 meters. So, we come to a conclusion that moving objects appear shorter along the direction of motion by exactly that factor. If all this makes sense so far, then great. Because before I end this video, I'm going to show you one mind-bending paradox that seems to break all the logic.
Suppose Alice has a garage that is six meters long and is at rest with her. Now Bob is carrying a 10 meter long pole with him. Right now, everyone is at rest, and this 10 meters is the rest length or the proper length of the pole, which means the length of the pole measured in the frame where the pole is at rest. In this rest frame, the pole is longer than the garage, and there is no way it could fit inside the garage. Then Bob started moving towards the garage with a constant speed of 0.8 times c. Yeah, it is hypothetical, but you can assume he has some futuristic propulsion system to achieve that. The garage has two doors, a left door, where Bob enters, and a right door, where Bob exits. Both the doors can open and close vertically like this. Right now, both the doors are kept in an open position. Using the same length contraction formula, we find that the length of the pole as seen by Alice will be 10 over gamma or 6 meters. So, in Alice's frame, the pole appears exactly 6 meters long, the same as the garage. It seems that for a brief moment, the entire pole fits perfectly inside the garage. Now, this is what Alice thinks. At the instant she sees the entire pole inside, she simultaneously closes both garage doors, trapping the entire pole inside, and reopens them quickly so Bob can continue running. Everything works according to the plan, and both the garage doors and the pole are safe, at least according to Alice. Now, here comes the twist. From Bob's point of view, he is at rest, and it is the garage that is rushing toward him, so in his frame, it's the garage that appears contracted, not the pole. The 10-meter-long pole stays 10 meters, but the garage shrinks to just 6 divided by gamma, which is approximately 3.6 meters. So now, in Bob's frame, the garage is much shorter than the pole. As he runs into it, the front of the pole is already exiting the right side before the back has even entered the left. So in his version of the story, there's never a moment when the whole pole is inside the garage. And worse, if Alice tries to close both doors simultaneously, one of them will hit the pole. But in Alice's version, she never hits the pole. She sees it completely inside the garage and safely opens and closes the doors without any issue. Now, the question is, who is right? That's the paradox, and in the next video, we will see how both versions of the story are correct using the Lorentz transformation. So, stay tuned. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, you can support my channel by joining our community and becoming a member. So good.